Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another week of The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. So glad you are here. It's been a while since I've had you all to myself without a guest host. We've enjoyed speaking to Jim DiPiante over the past few weeks regarding Tradiciones Custodes and the restrictions on the traditional Latin Mass and the Society of St. Pius X and all of the different intricacies and differences between the Novus Ordo Rite or the New Rite of the Mass and the traditional liturgy. This week we are going to look at what's going on in the world around us. Um, so much happening, you know, so many things going on. This is not uh, flesh and blood. This is principles and principalities in this present darkness. And I think we would all agree, uh, especially coming off of uh, yet again another tragic shooting. Um, many young children died in, in a shooting in Texas. Um, just after uh, one in New York the week before. Uh, we need to be uh, praying and fasting for souls out there because souls are starving, souls are dying, and this world uh, continues to darken. Uh, of course, we do not lose faith. We do not lose hope. We have that faith, and we have that hope in our Lord and His Holy Catholic Church and um, it is time for heroes. If, if ever there's been a time for heroes and heroic valor and testimony to the faith, to the holy Catholic faith, it is today. You know, we can't change the world, but we can change the world around us. So let us uh, look deep within ourselves. We can't look at the news. We can't look at all of the tragedy going on, whether it's uh, home or abroad, you know, speaking of Russia, Ukraine, we cannot focus on, you know, just the the tragedies around us. We cannot just look at the problems in our church. We need to look at the problems in our own souls. We need to look at the problems in our own families and start there. We need to be aware of things going on around us, but we cannot be consumed by them. We need to be consumed with our salvation and service to our Lord who has given his life to us so that we may have life within us and be with him for all eternity. We have spoken about many uh, heroic priests over the past couple of episodes and some of the and some of the ramifications against them for their acts of heroism uh, in the face of controversy in the face of supposed progress and movement of the church to a different level, to a different understanding of what our holy faith is. Uh, we should never conform to the world, and yet it seems, if we round even our church, uh, tries in certain respects to conform to the wants and the needs of where the world is going, we need to be looking at the wants and needs of souls, not the spirit of the world. And in that light, I think it is important to take a look at the recent leak regarding Roe versus Wade and the potential for reversal of uh, such horrific decisions of our government to allow abortion on demand. And now, um, you know, very heroic bishops beginning to come out. Specifically, Archbishop Carleone, who uh, a week ago stated publicly and definitively that uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is a proclaimed Catholic, shall no longer be permitted to receive Holy Communion due to her progressive uh, stance and support of abortion. I would like to congratulate Archbishop Carleone and applaud him for such a heroic step in the face of our political leaders and an example to his fellow bishops and priests 
that we need to reclaim the faith from such politicians and progressives that go against the teachings of Holy Mother Church, yet proclaim to be Catholics. There was a quote of uh, a Bishop Liam Carey who uh, defended Archbishop Carleone, and I think this is very pertinent, and I think it's very relatable to us individually. He says regarding the prohibition of receiving of communion to House Speaker Pelosi, he states, The scandalizing gap between belief and behavior on the part of the Speaker of the House grievously misleads her fellow believers about Catholic teaching on social justice and seriously handicaps Catholic efforts to defend unborn life in the womb. And this is so true, not just for Speaker Pelosi and the scandalizing gap between belief and behavior. This is infiltrated our church as a whole. There is a huge gap between belief and behavior of most Catholics. And I think it's about time that our leaders in the church stand up. And God bless Archbishop Cardellone and his fellow bishops, whom there are many now, Thankfully, coming out in support of him and not sitting in the shadows, worried what the politicians will say about him or what other progressive church leaders may say about him, they're in support. So it's about time that our church leaders stood up and defended the faith. That's what the people want. We want our bishops to defend the faith, and they haven't. For many years, that's a fact. They've allowed the rustling and the spirit of the world to creep in and now sit in the pews and dictate how our faith should be lived and what we can and cannot say in public. Those days are done. Thanks be to God, Archbishop Carleone, for opening this door that should have never been shut. And resounding the theme between gap of belief and practice, Bishop David Kundela states on the subject as well, if a person cannot recognize the obvious presence of God in a living baby in the womb of its mother, then how would they ever discover the presence of God in the mystery of the Eucharist? Amen, right? If you can't even recognize what science has proven now, that there is a life form in the womb of a mother, if you can't recognize that, how can you recognize that the God-man himself is in the Holy Eucharist? And that's where we are, because most Catholics don't believe that. And it's much easier for today's Catholics as a whole to believe that abortion is okay rather than believe in the Blessed Sacrament. 50% of Catholics would say that abortion is okay in certain circumstances, while 70% 70 would say that there's no way that Jesus dwells in the Blessed Sacrament upon the altar. This is statistical proof regarding the gap between our behavior and and belief due to that behavior. Like we've quoted in the past few weeks, lex orandi, lex credendi. The way you pray is the way you believe. And our world, we know, is not praying. And if we're praying and we have the belief that abortion is okay and our Lord is not in the Blessed Sacrament, what are we praying? How are we praying? Obviously, there is no credendi if there is no orande. And so you are subject to whatever the news media, or crooked politicians, or crooked church leaders dictate. There, I'll say it. And to further hammer that home, let's quote Washington, D.C.'s own Cardinal Wilton Gregory regarding his response to Archbishop Carleone's ban of communion on Nancy Pelosi. Keeping in mind that prior to his appointment as Cardinal of Washington, D.C., he was Archbishop of Atlanta, Georgia, where he allowed the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception to participate for years in an annual gay pride parade. He has also banned the traditional Latin Mass in Washington, but all of that is besides the point. The good cardinal says, The actions of Archbishop Carleone are his decision to make in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. Cardinal Gregory has not instructed the priests of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Washington to refuse communion to anyone. I'm pretty sure, but certainly open to correction, that that Catholics are subject to the bishop or ordinary in which diocese they are registered. And as Nancy Pelosi is from, she would be subject to her local ordinary, that being Archbishop Carleone. This past weekend at a Catholic church in Georgetown, Maryland, she attended the 9 a.m. Mass at Holy Trinity in Georgetown neighborhood, 
where President Biden apparently attends as well, and presented herself for Holy Communion in which she received. Regarding her ban on communion, she asserted that she knows the Catholic faith better than her archbishop, saying that his actions are not compatible with the book of Matthew. I'd like to toss a piece of scripture out there from St. Matthew myself. It comes from chapter 18, verse 6 and following. But he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone should be hanged about his neck, and that he should be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of scandals. So not only do we have a public scandal by a prominent Catholic, but we also have a cardinal who is complicit in her sin. And according to a catholicvote.org petition to show support for Archbishop Corleone, they point out that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops met last year formally to recognize two important principles. One, abortion is the preeminent moral issue of our time. Absolutely. And two, it is time for renewed teaching about the importance of the Eucharist, including reaffirming the Church's teachings about when Catholics may and may not present themselves to receive the Blessed Sacrament. Agreed. A hundred percent. And in acting so, Corleone acted in union with the whole body of Catholic leaders on both accounts. And according to this CatholicVote.org poll, they also point out that 83 percent of Catholics believed that Catholic public officials who oppose church teaching create confusion and disunity, and 74% said such officials should not present themselves for communion. So what in the world is going on? We have the Catholic Conference of Bishops proclaiming, stating very clearly that they need to reinforce Catholic position on abortion and understanding of the Eucharist. Yet, for some reason, certain leaders, many of them, still don't agree with that and want to go against it. I'd go even further beyond Catholic public officials. I would say let's go to Catholic church officials who are going against the teaching of the church. It's time to call them out. Let's not just go against the public officials. Let's call out the ones who are going against the Catholic church's teaching as a whole, any of them, whether in the church or public ministry, private ministry, I I don't care. The sheep have been led astray for going on 50 years blatantly by corrupt church leaders prancing around in wolves' clothing, dancing with the politicians and with the leaders of society. And it's not just Jason Murphy saying it, it's cardinals and bishops and archbishops saying it as well. At this time, there were 13 other prominent Catholic churchmen who have weighed in on their support, and I'd like to name them, just so everyone out there knows who is in support of this and who is not. And yes, there's going to be some that are quiet and don't want to get involved, but if ever there's a time to get involved, the time is now. So I call upon church leaders everywhere, from priests to deacons to bishops, archbishops, and above, to defend Archbishop Carleone for his brave effort. These brave church leaders include Archbishop Nauman of Archdiocese of Kansas City, Bishop Donald Hying of the Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin, Archbishop Samuel Akia of Archbishop of Denver, Colorado, Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, Bishop James Conley of Lincoln, Nebraska, Bishop Vasca of Santa Rosa, California, Bishop Barber of Oakland, California, Archbishop Paul Coakley of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Bishop Thomas Peproki of the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, Bishop David Ricken, Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin, Bishop Liam Carey, who we spoke about earlier from the Diocese of Baker, Oregon, Bishop Thomas Daly, Spokane, Washington, Bishop Michael Olson, Fort Worth, Texas, Bishop James Wall of the Diocese of Gallup, New Mexico. And most recently, a bishop that I think we're all familiar with, Bishop Michael Burbage of Arlington, Virginia, who was previously bishop of the Diocese of Raleigh, North Carolina, from 2006 to 2016. He summarizes his stance on Nancy Pelosi by stating, And so the doors are open to her, to any of us who wander away from the Lord and from what he teaches. Thank you, brave bishops and archbishops, for standing up and leading the church. 
The church wants our leaders to lead. The church wants the bishops to lead. We can say along with Bishop Conley, we fervently pray for a conversion of heart for Speaker Pelosi and for all those who advocate for the destruction of human life in the womb. Let us pray that all people recognize the dignity of every human soul, man, woman, and child, born and unborn. So this is a fantastic example set forth by one of our church leaders in the face of adversity and pressure from the world and the political system to go against what the world would have him do. And this conflict is not only the church against the state, the church is up against adversity within its own ranks. Look at the German Synod. Look at the cancellation of the traditional Latin Mass. Look at the promotion of the LGBTQ agenda. All of these things that the world would have us believe are okay and right and we should be supporting, and if not, we are close-minded and judgmental and racist and misogynist and all of the other litany that goes along with it. But it's not only against the world in which we stand, it's against corrupt leaders in our church. And we've spoken about this ad nauseum over the past several weeks, especially in regards to the cancellation of the traditional Latin mass and liturgies. However, there's another cardinal I think is noteworthy of bringing up, Cardinal Mueller, who is actually German himself, and in the face of the German synodal way, which is a complete woke mess in the eyes of traditional teaching and understanding of the church, Cardinal Mueller has recently ordained seven deacons and a priest of the Institute of the Good Shepherd in Court Leon, France, according to the traditional rubrics of ordination. In his homily, Mueller criticized that the German synod denies the sacrament of holy orders because its participants believe that laymen and bishops may change the apostolic doctrine by a majority vote. For these agnostic relativists, the church's dogmas are seen as changeable and time-conditioned objectifications of some vague religious feeling, Mueller analyzed. That's hitting the nail on the head. The first time I heard about this whole synod and the synodal way, it was utter confusion. It was about emotions. It was about opinions and asking the faithful to let the church know the direction it should go. No way, no how. That's not how it works. Yet, apparently, that's what many bishops and many cardinals in the church this, these days believe. They believe that everything is changeable and conformable to what society will have us want. That's what they wanted in the 1960s, the 1970s, and that's what they're wanting now. Now that tradition has been returning in great numbers with, with many conversions and much fruit being born within the traditional mass following, they want to now cancel it. This is a threat to the new system. This is the threat to the new church. It sounds a little hard to digest. It sounds a little conspiracy theorist. I understand that. But it's a fact. Take a look at it. Look up the names. Look at the players in the games. Look up the German Synod and who's involved there and some of the things they're associated with. Back in April, 74 bishops signed a letter to the German bishops expressing concern about the country's synodal path, which voted on a series of reforms in February. The letter warns the German synodal consultations hold the potential for schism and identifies seven specific criticisms such as the charge the Germans' process relied more on sociological analysis and contemporary political and gender ideology. At the meetings of the German Catholics earlier this year, the synodal body publicly voted for a document calling for women deacons and for involving lay people in the selection of bishops, as well as calling a relaxation of the rule of celibacy for the clergy and for some kind of blessing of same-sex unions. Previously, the bishops of Scandinavia voiced concerns about the direction, the methodology, and the substance of the German consultations, as did the president of the Polish Bishops' Conference. It's a wreck. Our church is under attack. Our church leaders are misguided, and through their misguidedness, they are misguiding the faithful. They're not only bringing themselves down, they're taking the faithful with them. 
And finally, Cardinal Mueller summarizes this stance on the Synodal Way and what traditional and Orthodox Catholics are facing these days is psychological terror. He says, faithful Catholics are today facing a period of persecution, tribulation, and psychological terror that in an unprecedented way is coming from within their own countries that have ancient Christian traditions. We're talking about some serious things here, people. We're not just speculating. We're not just making assumptions and following uh, extreme conspiracy theories. We're looking at actual events, actual things, and actual players of a game that we don't want to be playing especially when it comes to the practices and principles of our holy Catholic faith. Hopefully, Archbishop Cordelione will not be the only one to come out publicly. I say line them up and knock them down. Who's next? What other politicians are playing both sides of the aisles, publicly proclaiming they're Catholic, while voting and promoting anti-Catholic and anti-Christian agenda? So this is a fine example set forth for us by our leaders of what happens when there is a gap between our belief and our behavior. Our leaders we rely on must be firm and must be clear about what is right and what is wrong. So how does that affect us? We've identified the problem. We've identified what the proper solution is of our church leaders. So what can we as individuals do? We can do the same thing in our homes. We can do the same thing in our lives. If our behavior is not united with our beliefs, then we need to pause and figure out what needs to fill that gap or what is filling that gap that needs to be removed. If we're preaching one thing and living another, there's a problem. If we're relying on others to raise our children instead of setting the example for them, there's a problem. It starts with us. Thankfully, we have a readily curable solution to the gap that sometimes gets in between our belief and our behavior. It's called confession. If we're living our lives and we're paying attention to what we're doing or not doing, there's a very easy way to fix it. We go, we humbly ask for confession, we make firm amends to amend our life, and we do it. We return to prayer. We return to the practices that our church sets as an example. And we live our Christian lives with sanctifying grace as an aid. We do not rely on someone else to form our children in the faith. Men, I'm talking to you. Many men believe that it's a woman's role to instill the faith into their children and to show the examples of Christian principles and actions wrong. We are the foundation of our families. We have to build that foundation and form it from the ground up. Our wives fill it with love and they support us. But we have to be the first cause of faith in our families. Not the only cause, but the first cause. Statistics show that when a man is engaged in his faith, his children will be engaged in his faith. When the man is removed from the faith, the children have far less ability to hold on to the faith. I think we've gone over a little bit on this segment, but we'll take a quick break, maybe regather our thoughts, take a few breaths, and we'll be right back. Did you know that 90% of older adults wish to stay in their home as they age? Aging in place has many benefits. It tends to improve quality of life, which in return improves physical health. Also, retaining independence as we age is critically important to our mental health. Hi, my name is Meredith Dignan, and I am the president of Harmony Home Solutions and an active parishioner of St. Patrick Cathedral. We are your trusted partner for aging in place. We strive to enhance the lives of older adults and their families by providing premier aging in place and universal design lifestyle solutions that increase safety beautifully. Now is the time to get your aging in place plan in order with Harmony Home Solutions. Visit our website today at hhsclt.com. Again, that's hhsclt.com. Or give us a call at 980-220-8821. Again, that's 980-220-8821. We want to help you live an empowered and beautiful life. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody 
is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Hey everybody, my name is Bill Snyder. I'm one of the hosts of The Remnant along with my good friends Stephen Thomas and Ray Haywood. And we are so very blessed to be able to broadcast this hard-hitting men's show on the Carolina Catholic Media Network every single Saturday at 5 o'clock p.m. This show offers perspective from three different generations of men, and we tackle tough topics. But the amazing thing is, while we're hard-hitting, we never leave you angry and always hungry for more. So I hope you listen to us. You can tune in in a variety of ways on air at 1270 a.m. in the Charlotte area. You can also follow, friend, and like us on social media. You'll be able to find our social media channels available to you by searching for Carolina Catholic Media Network. There's also a wonderful app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. You are able to download it. Just search for Carolina Catholic Media Network and you will find us and our podcasted versions of the show right there in the app. We hope you tune in and as we always say, may God bless you and your families. And we are back. Thanks again for tuning in to The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. We just had a heated segment discussing the recent statement of Archbishop Carleone uh, banning House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is a self-proclaimed Catholic, but a staunch promoter and defender of abortion on demand in all states, and how important it is for our church leaders to stand up against society and against political leaders, especially those who proclaim to be Catholic and set a public scandal for those others who look to our leaders, especially in the church, for guidance and who cause public scandal when they fly their flag of Catholicism when it is necessary to get votes or to help others get votes and then put it away Um, Not quietly, but put it away quite publicly on the many number of positions that are not compatible with the Catholic Church. I was listening to some older country music the other day, and a song came on, and the title of the song is Simple Man. And I've said many times on this show, I am just an ignorant, simple man looking for answers to the questions that we propose here on this show and that many folks in our diocese and in our church are having these days. And thankfully, we are seeing some of the answers, especially by uh, brave, courageous church leaders who are no longer going to put up with it. There's one verse in this song by Charlie Daniels, and it stands out, and I think it's very pertinent, so I'm going to read it. I'm definitely not going to sing it to you, but he states... Well, you know what's wrong with the world today? People done gone and put their Bibles away. They're living by the law of the jungle, not the law of the land. Well, the good book says it's so I know it's the truth, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You better watch where you go and remember where you've been. That's the way I see it. I'm a simple man. So I'm not sure I am on board with the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, But he says that, you know what's wrong with the world today is that people have done gone and put their Bibles away. And that was written back in the 80s. So that is not a a new revelation. Uh, I think it's very clear. We can look at uh, anything going on in our world uh, mostly today and notice that uh, it revolves around the fact that man has, has put away God. Man has tucked him away as fairy tale, as myth and as a stumbling block to progressive uh, ideas and ideologies that are not compatible with traditional Judeo-Christian values. And all of this sort of reminds me of a broadcast I heard replayed by Paul Harvey, who is an American broadcaster, and in April of 1965, he broadcast a message named, If I Were the Devil. 
So this is almost 60 years ago, and I'm going to go ahead and play it now because I think it's very important for us to think about what was said about the world in which we now live in. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the... So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings... I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious What'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. In less than 60 years, everything this man talked about in 1965 has pretty much come to fruition. This is the world in which we live in, and how would he have the foreknowledge to predict everything we've seen. He begins this talk by the devil stating that he wants to take the material possessions of the world, but he wouldn't be happy until he received the ripest apple on the tree, the, you and me. And we know that from the very beginning. We know that when the bad angels fell from their pride, from not wanting to serve our Lord, who was a human being, non-servium, and that humans would be brought to heaven, that humans would be given the opportunity for salvation to be elevated even higher than the angels, Satan placed his target on our Lord and on all of us. From there, he goes on to invite each of us to do as you please, to ignore what has been handed down by tradition, by our faith, by our religion, and do what you want. The Bible is a myth. He would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. He goes through to explain how he would turn the focus and the worship due to our God upon ourselves, how television and drugs would become worse and more predominant in our world. Families would be at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, nations at war with themselves, 
And he continues through speaking about fanning the flames. He would encourage schools not to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let them run wild and... And before you know it, you would have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Wow. We would have judges promoting pornography. God would be removed from the courthouse. We've seen that. The Ten Commandments removed from public property. No prayer in public. And he speaks of priests and pastors misusing boys and girls and church money. He talks about communism and how he would take from those who have and give it to those who want until he had killed the incentive of the ambitious. Well, this is where we are in this seemingly pro-communism and pro-socialist government, which has penetrated our United States. Making his way to the end, he would caution against extremes and hard work in patriotism, in moral conduct. I think we've seen that in the past four or five years, where anyone who is patriotic supportive of our country, as we know in a historical manner, is considered racist or conspiracy theorist, which by the way is how the traditionalists and followers of the traditional Latin mass are looked at and judged by progressives in the church. Those who are wanting to adhere to tradition of not just faith and morals, but also of the liturgy that have been around for 1,500 years are now ostracized and extremist. Just like those who want to be faithful to our country and what our country was built upon are now extremist and racist and judgmental and, and all of that. So any anyone in the side of progression is going to be looked at as an enemy of the state and of the church, apparently. He would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned and swinging is more fun. I think we can see that with the number of people who live together before getting married and the number of divorces, the attack on the family. That's the key. That is where he strikes and strikes hard and fast. And finally, he concludes by saying, I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with disease for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep doing what he's doing. You're listening to The Obligation, and we're going to take a quick break and be right back. Twenty twenty two is bringing many new and exciting changes to our Carolina Catholic Apostolate built to communicate how to better learn, love, and live our Catholic faith. We begin with our name change to Carolina Catholic Media. This reflects the expanded scope of Carolina Catholic Radio to include the development of our podcast, streaming, social media, YouTube, and direct marketing platforms. 2022 is a very important year for the Catholic Church. As a result, Carolina Catholic Media will feature more local news, information, and conversation to reflect what's happening now and how it impacts our local Catholic community. Throughout the year, Carolina Catholic Media will showcase our Catholic schools and homeschools, the Charlotte Diocese 50th anniversary, and the two-year worldwide synod process that begins on the diocesan level. We encourage you to get involved, join us, and catch the spirit. The Carolina Catholic Media Apostolate is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are 100% funded by you. Please consider a donation, monthly tithe, or business sponsorship to support our mission and vision to spread the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. Thank you for discerning a role in our apostolate. May God bless you abundantly. This is Jason Murphy for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas and the Obligation Radio Show here on the Carolina Catholic Media Network. Catholic Radio is live and on the air at AM 1270, broadcasting from Belmont, North Carolina, to the Charlotte Regional Area. Carolina Catholic produces more local content than most Catholic radio stations across our country. Tune in on air, online, on demand, and anytime at www.carolinacatholic.org. Make sure to catch the 2022 Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas replays each Saturday afternoon starting at 3 p.m. 
You can catch Keith Nestor, Tim Staples, Dr. Ray Garundi, our own Dr. John Aquaviva, and find out what the buzz is all about for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas. Also, make sure to tune in to the featured men's shows on Carolina Catholic, Faith and Sport with Dr. John Aquaviva, airing on Mondays at 5 p.m. and on demand, The Remnant with Stephen Thomas, Bill Snyder, and Ray Haywood, airing on Saturdays at 5, and my show, The Obligation, which airs at 5 p.m. on Fridays. Catch all of these shows and more at AM1270, on air, online, and over the app at www.carolinacatholic.org. Once again, this has been Jason Murphy. God bless and Esto Beer. Welcome back to The Obligation. We were just listening to a clip from 1965, a broadcast by Paul Harvey entitled, If I Were the Devil. And he goes through quite a list of uh, topics and ideas that if, if he were the devil, what he would do to win our souls. And going through this whole list, we can see 60 years later, they have all come to fruition. Our world is in disarray. You don't have to look far. Turn on any news channel, look at any news blog or social media, and you can see the world in which we live. If you have any doubts that the devil is alive and well in this world and souls are being won by him, look no further than the latest news headline. You know, even this last school shooting in Evalde, Texas, horrible, a horrible situation. I think we're all heartbroken over this. And it's just one of many continuations of symptoms showing how sick our world is. But even in the face of such travesties and such heartache and such pain, we see how politics is the religion of our times. We see that the politicians are the moral compasses of our times. There was even a statement aimed at Governor Texas Greg Abbott and his officials regarding the shooting by by Representative Ruben Gallego of Arizona, who says, F your prayers. F your prayers. He goes on to send a tweet to Senator Ted Cruz of Texas saying, just to be clear, F you, Ted Cruz, you effing baby killer. And of course, it didn't stop there. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York jumped in as well and said, there is no such thing as being pro-life while supporting laws that let children be shot in their schools. Elders in grocery stores, worshipers in their houses of faith, survivors by abusers, or anyone in a crowded place. It is an idolatry of violence and it must end, says pro-choice Representative Ocasio-Cortez. So they love hiding behind our own statements because we're not defending them. Our church has not been defending them. So thankfully, some of our leaders in the church have come out. Because unless they come out and make a formal stance, and we have hypocrites running our country proclaiming to be Catholics, this is where we are going. This is what it's going to look like. So yes, we have removed God from society. We are the cause and we are the cure. But you and I both know that this is not a gun problem. This is not a drug problem. This is not a legal problem. This is a heart problem. This is a sin problem. Sin is the first cause of everything we see in this world. So if we're looking for a legislative solution or a political solution to the problems we have going on, we are in for a big disappointment. The only solution is for you and I to live our faith, the faith that was taught by our Lord to the apostles and handed down through the Holy Catholic Church. And the only way we will be able to do this is if our church leaders continue to defend the faith in the face of adversity uh, and pressure from society and political leaders. We have to start in our homes. We start with ourselves. We extend that to our families, our children, our wives. We take it out to our workplace, to our places of worship, our organizations, our friends. And from there, we we spread the light that has been placed within us. The only way to probably do that is if our church is 
on the same page. If our church is trying to go the direction of society and politicians, then no, there's going to be an ever mounting battle between the two and we're going to be left out there to dry. It is a time for definitive change. It is a time to return to orthodoxy. It is a time to return to traditional worship of our Lord. Not this synodal way of what's new and what's next and where's society going and how can the church walk hand in hand with it. No, no way. It's time to be rerooted in our holy Catholic faith. We must be supported and be offered the sacraments and the faith and the beliefs that have been handed down to us. No longer can we permit our church to misguide us and lead us into the next generation where the world is going because the world is not getting any better. It is getting far worse. St. Paul reminds us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You're listening to The Obligation, and we'll be right back. Hello, Carolina Catholic family. This is David Papandria, founder and chairman of Carolina Catholic Media. Please join us during our 2022 Catch the Spirit Pledge Drive season, starting with Giving Tuesdays and culminating with our 36-hour Sacred Heart share June 22 through 24. Your pledge will help us better plan and allocate resources to evangelize the truth of Jesus Christ across our seven media platforms in the Carolinas. Every dollar raised goes back into the Carolina Catholic operating and capital expense budget to grow our apostolate. When you consider the state of the world and the extraordinary times that we're living in with a cancel culture, unprecedented media bias, mistruths and disinformation everywhere, it's clear why Carolina Catholic media is here. Our mission is to communicate the truth of Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church to over 5 million souls in the Diocese of Charlotte and upstate South Carolina. With that comes a commitment to create diverse local programs from our parishes, schools, and ministries. Our vision is to bring everyone together as one unified Carolina Catholic community. Carolina Catholic Media is a 501c3 nonprofit. Your financial gift is 100% tax deductible. To sponsor or donate, please email me at feedback at carolinacatholicradio.org or call me at 800-857-2909. That's 800-857-2909. We appreciate your prayerful consideration to support us during our Catch the Spirit Pledge Drive. May God bless you abundantly. Welcome back to The Obligation. We have been talking about sin. That's what it all boils down to. We've been talking about sin and hope because, yes, there is sin in this life, but uh, the cure to that is hope. It is our faith in Jesus Christ. It is the promotion of morals and ethics and true worship of our Lord in this world. That is the cure to what ails the world in which we live. And though there be many issues we can focus on that are horrible and negative, uh, sin is, is, is horrible and sin is negative. But the difference is we now see church leaders who are standing up against leaders in the church who are not teaching and showing the way to the flock. And we're also seeing a parallel in society where we have courageous lawmakers who are standing up at the same time. I think we're at a pivotal point in society, in our time, where those who are faithful and those who want to see goodness in this world and acknowledge they are a created being and not the creator of all things, we are seeing a shift. A piece of news that is not negative out of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt signed into law the most protective abortion ban in the country, per LifeSite News. The measure is a Texas-style law that includes a private right of action as enforcement, but instead of protecting babies at six weeks with their heart, when their 
At six weeks, when their heartbeat can be detected as the Texas law does, it starts protecting unborn children at conception when their life begins. The Texas abortion ban is a unique law that has been on the books for over 260 days and saved as many as 17,000 or more babies from abortion. Governor Stitt promised Oklahomans that as governor, I would sign every piece of pro-life legislation that came across my desk, and I am proud to keep that promise today. From the moment life begins at conception is when we have a responsibility as human beings to do everything we can to protect that baby's life and the life of the mother. That is what I believe, and that is what the majority of Oklahomans believe If other states want to pass different laws, that is their right. But in Oklahoma, we will always stand up for life. Thank you, Governor Stitt. This is heroic. This is what our proclaimed pro-life governors and leaders need to be doing. This is what our church leaders need to be doing. They are going to face backlash. They are going to be accused of controlling women and taking away rights. But nothing is further than the truth. They are protecting life. Church leaders, protect the church. Stand up in the face of this world which wants to destroy everything that is good and holy in this life. And I need to clarify that I'm not speaking to just church leaders that hold a office or someone in the hierarchy. I am talking to the men of the church as a whole. Women, if you're listening to, great. Support your men. If you don't have a man who's standing up for his faith and his beliefs and what is right and just, then then by all means, stand up and lead yourself. But men, I'm talking to you. We're not talking about only the church leaders because men, we are the leaders of our domestic church. We all lead a domestic church if we are married and have children. And if we don't, we are still leaders in our small worlds, in our businesses, in our relationships with friends and relatives, in our church. We're all called to lead, to lead others to heaven for the salvation of souls. Our Lord declares to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. This has been a call to arms, not arms that are weapons, but arms that are folded in prayer. It is our call of duty right now to be examples to the world in which we live and break away from the complacency and from the fear of offending and live true, authentic Catholic lives. That is what we're called to. That is what we are responsible to live. The days of complacency and sitting back and saying, oh, someone else will handle it. Someone else will step up. Someone else will speak out. No, it is your responsibility. And if you're not doing that, you are not fulfilling your obligation to be the men the fathers, the husband, God has calling you to be. Well, we have covered a lot of ground today. We have talked about some very difficult topics. We have talked about some very sad and troubling times in our world, but we've also spoken about some things that should give us hope. Hope that our church leaders are beginning to wake up to this woke and cancel and godless culture and to stand up against those who will proclaim to be Catholic, yet in their political realm, they are certainly nothing further from the truth. We certainly pray for their conversion. We pray for the salvation of souls, but we also have work to do. We have work to do in our own lives and our own souls, and ultimately it boils down to becoming saints. Becoming a saint is an act of heroism, Uh, It takes a lot of work in this world. It takes a lot of prayer, sacrifice, denial of oneself for the greater glory of God in all things. And to close out, I'd like to talk about some heroes. We're going to be celebrating Memorial Day in just a few days, and we know that the life in which we enjoy in the United States of America was won by many of those who have given their life and paid the ultimate sacrifice for our rights and freedom to live how we would like to live. Uh, Certainly we know there are ways we should be living, but if we so choose, uh, our government at least allows us the right to to live how we would like. You know, it may not be compatible with God's will or with the Christian walk, but the United States of America and the heroes who have died to protect its freedoms shall never go unnoticed or be forgotten.
Memorial Day was originally known as Decoration Day, and it originated in the years after the Civil War, but became an official federal holiday in 1971. We honor all of those men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military, and unofficially marks the beginning of the summer season. This weekend, we will also celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. May his grace be ever with us so that we may rise in this life to become the heroes and the saints that we're called to so that we may rise with him on our last day. May God bless you this weekend. A safe and happy Memorial Day. God bless and esto vir. If you enjoyed this episode and have any questions or comments or would like to come on the show and discuss your faith walk or any issue regarding the Catholic Church, send us an email at feedback at theobligationshow.com. You can also catch all of our previous episodes and all of the shows of Carolina Catholic Media at www.carolinacatholic.org. Click that donate button and we'd greatly appreciate it. There are also many opportunities to sponsor the show, the radio station, and the Catholic Men's Conference. Join Census Fidelium, Harmony Home Solutions, and Wallach Investments, who have pledged their funds to help keep Catholic radio on the air and relevant. Census Fidelium is a collection of Catholic homilies, apologetic videos, and other resources to grow in one true faith. They can be found online at www.sensusfidelium.com. Wallach Investment LLC is a strategic moral investing firm committed to placing their clients' interest ahead of their own. Their mission is to be a force of good in their relationships to make the most of their clients' investment, giving them the time and confidence to pursue their mission. Contact Daniel Wallach at www.wallachinvestments.com for more information. For the Obligation Radio Show, the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas, and the Carolina Media Network, my name is Jason Murphy. God bless and esto vivo.